and where we need to go. Uh, and so while this undertaking is no doubt going to be a profound challenge, uh, I think we also need to view it as a profound opportunity. Over the next decades, we are going to have to substantially decarbonize our economy in order to stave off the more catastrophic effects of global warming. But as many of the speakers at the summit, both today and tomorrow, will emphasize, this also allows us as a society to imagine a new economy uh, that is not only sustainable, but perhaps more radically democratic and hopefully uh, more just. Transition is the opportunity to, excuse the pun, imagine a 3D society, one that is decarbonized, democratic, and decolonized. So while our presentation today is primarily focused on the emission targets that we need to achieve, remember that how we achieve those targets is equally important. Do we merely reproduce the relations of power that have brought us to climate emergency, or do we challenge those relations? Um, and certainly the environment, uh, environmental movement in the past has often been at odds with poor people, uh, with workers, um, with indigenous people. Um, and if we're going to address climate change and be successful at it, we will need everybody on board. And that's why we need to ensure that inequality and colonialism are also a target of climate action. It's why we need to ensure that our actions don't just use the same old tools that make life more difficult for some while enriching others. So, let's begin. Uh, so here is where Saskatchewan um, stands in regards to GHG emissions right now. We produce 75 megatons. Um, in per capita terms, we are one of the highest, uh, are we done? Like this? Yeah. Okay. In per capita terms, we are one of the highest emitters in the world. More than Saudi Arabia, more than Kuwait, more than Bahrain. Um, and a lot of the other uh, Gulf oil kingdoms. So we have a profound responsibility uh, to ourselves and to the rest of the world to make a concerted effort to reduce our emissions. If we don't take responsibility for our emissions, someone else will have to, okay? And this is already happening, even within our own country, okay? So between 2005 and 2015, Canada actually reduced its overall climate uh, pollution. Well, some provinces did. 10 provinces and territories actually reduced their climate pollution. Unfortunately, Saskatchewan and Alberta increased emissions during the same period, effectively wiping out those gains, as you can see here. This won't buy us much goodwill in the rest of the country if we continue with this. Why should other provinces make good faith efforts to reduce emissions if we just wipe out those achievements? We need to take action to ensure that others will as well, okay? Okay, as you can see here, there are three different targets. Um, the first is where the Saskatchewan government's uh, Prairie Resilience Plan gets us. As you can see, it reduces emissions to about 63 megatons. Uh, the second is the Paris target. That's a 30% emission reduction that the federal government has um, committed us to. Uh, so if every province has to reduce its emissions by a third, uh, that would get us to about 48 megatons. Uh, lastly are the revised uh, targets after the recent IPCC report that concludes we actually need to do better than Paris. We actually need to reduce our emissions by 45% rather than 30. That would mean that Saskatchewan would need to hit 38 megatons by 2030. That's almost a 50% reduction. Um, and just to be clear, uh, you know, even if we make these targets, that the job's not done. Uh, the federal government has also committed to uh, hitting an 80% reduction by 2050. So those are the targets um, that we are promising to get there. Uh, here is the government's current plan with its targeted reductions by each sector. You can see that almost half the intended reductions, 12.5 megatons, are for carbon credits for existing practices that sequester carbon. Um, they're hoping that the federal government will give them these credits, but that's highly unlikely in my opinion. We're already reaping the benefits of these practices, um, otherwise our emissions would be even higher, and we would have to make even greater reductions. They're just paper reductions. Yeah. Uh, so the actual stated emission reductions in the government's plan is only between 14 and 14.5 megatons. That's a long way off from the Paris target and nowhere near the revised IPCC targets. So 
So the government's current plan is inadequate to where we need to go. Uh, we need to adopt much more aggressive reduction measures to get us to where we need to be. And now I will end over to Okay. Um, so we wanted to give you a sense, we really like this graph from Sasquin. Some people have been asking us on Twitter why we're using the Sasquin graph. We know nothing about the revival of Sasquin. We just like it because it also breaks out the minerals and mining sector. Um, and so if we look at Saskatchewan's emissions by source, as you can see, the minerals and mining sector, which includes oil and gas, um, is the largest, followed by transportation, electricity generation, and agriculture. These are also very big culprits. So if we want to reduce our overall emissions, we're going to need to seriously address these sectors of our economy. Um, if we look at Saskatchewan's emissions by source, as you can see, um, sorry, if you look at Saskatchewan's historical emissions from 1993 to 2015, as you can see, they've been on an upward trajectory from just about 50 megatons in 1993 to 75 today. So this introduces another challenge. We aren't trying to cut emissions from a static position, but we're trying to cut them from historically rising emissions. So let's look at some of the different sectors. Um, we can look at uh, uh, some sectors that actually aren't driving the upwards increase in our emissions. Here's one, the public electricity um, sector. Um, and so this is electricity generation. It's a substantial part of our overall emissions, and we will need to make um, substantial reductions in this sector, sector, but it has been relatively level over the past 25 years. Um, and this doesn't include the major uh, power accounts and other accounts that you see in this um, slide here. So this is who consumes our electricity in Saskatchewan. We've underlined residential consumption. If you look at it, only 16.5% of total consumption comes from our individual homes. So by far the largest consumers are the big power accounts like potash and uranium mines. In fact, just 35 customers account for 45% of the power consumption in our province. So the point that we wanted to make here is to emphasize that individual solutions like home upgrades or energy efficient appliances are great, but they're not sufficient to significantly reduce power consumption in our province. And in terms of justice, it might not be fair to ask people who can at least afford it to carry the burden of reducing our emissions. Again, it doesn't mean they're not important, but if we're only going to look at individuals without tackling large industrial consumers, we're not going to get very far in reducing emissions from electricity consumption. So this is from uh, just emissions from just residential homes, just to drive this point home, about two megatons. Um, these have been level for quite some time. Again, a good idea to reduce emissions in this area, what you can do in your own home, but as you can see, residences by themselves just don't produce enough greenhouse gases to make them a significant or the most important part of the solution. Um, agriculture, also a large emitter. We have a workshop this afternoon on agriculture. Um, it will have to be addressed, but it's not the primary source of our rising emissions. So it has risen from about 10 megatons in the 90s to 12 today, um, but relatively stable to some of the other sectors. So what are the sectors that are driving our rising emiss emissions? As you might expect, the oil and gas industry is a big part of it. The blue line shows emissions from upstream oil and gas production. These have doubled in the past 25 years. We've been through a big oil boom. The green line is fugitive emissions. These are greenhouse gas emissions produced by the um, oil and gas sector that are just pure waste. It's um, gases that escape at the wellhead or, or spill out of pipelines. Um, or are vented and flared into the atmosphere. Um, they're sent directly into the environment as a byproduct of oil and gas production. We're not using them, burning them, putting them to productive use. Um, so as you can see, fugitive emissions have come down a little bit since 2001, but they have risen um, significantly and are a really significant portion of our total greenhouse gas emissions in Saskatchewan. The transportation sector is another sector that has seen a significant rise in emissions over the past 25 years, from 10 megatons in 93 to almost 17 today. About half of those emissions are from domestic transportation, and the other half is freight and commercial trucking. 
Um, so we're going to have to tackle both oil and gas and transportation as sources of rising emissions. We need strategies that can stabilize those and then reduce those, uh, the emissions in those sectors. Otherwise, they could continue to eat into any reductions we make in other sectors, for example, with the things that you're going to do as individuals in your own home. Um, so what we should take away from this overview is that no viable strategy to reduce emissions in Saskatchewan can neglect the oil and gas sector, and to a lesser extent, transportation. Individual strategies to get people to switch to hybrids or electrics or to upgrade the energy efficiency in their homes are all well and good, can be part of an overall strategy to reduce emissions and certainly have importance in encouraging people to participate in province-wide emissions. And that's really important. We need people participating and feeling part of the project, but we simply can't get where we need to be by individual strategies alone. Um, so just as a final illustration of this, if every individual resident in Saskatchewan reduced their emissions to zero, from their cars, their homes, their electricity consumption, it would only amount to a total reduction of between 10 and 12 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions, roughly a little bit less than the government of Saskatchewan has promised in prairie resilience. So while individual emissions are an important piece of the puzzle, they're not the primary source of Saskatchewan's high emissions, and we have to plan for how to reduce emissions substantially uh, by industry. And so I was just going to conclude. Okay, after that doom and gloom, um, what are our options? And we do have options, and certainly uh, over uh, the rest of today and tomorrow, you will hear a lot of different options as to what we can do. I'm only going to focus on one particular option, um, and that's renewable energy. So, as fate would have it, Saskatchewan is not only abundant in non-renewable resources like oil, potash, and uranium, it is also abundant in renewable resources that have barely begun to be exploited. So I'd really like to finish off with this is sort of take a look at the potential for renewable energy in Saskatchewan. So as you can see here, this is Saskatchewan's solar potential. The red and orange areas hold the best potential for solar energy in the country. As you can see, we are very well placed for that. Um, it's also, southern Saskatchewan, the location of our major coal-fired generation plants. Uh, so this holds tremendous potential to incubate a new solar industry in a part of the province that is fearful of the end of coal. Uh, it's ironic that the home for one dying industry could also be the home or the potential home for a new and upcoming industry. Um, but as luck would have it, we could allay the, a lot of the fears and uncertainty in these communities um, in southern Saskatchewan by making large investments in solar in the same area. Uh, the inset shows Germany's solar potential. It's nowhere near what Saskatchewan's is, and yet they already get about 7% of their overall power generation uh, from solar, while we get less than 1%. So we're just simply not exploiting this resource. Next is, and I apologize for the for a graphic, that's the best one I could find. Here's the country's onshore wind potential. Once again, Saskatchewan holds immense promise, with much of southern Saskatchewan a viable site for wind energy. Again, ironic that our best area for renewable energy is also the same area as our predominant coal production. So you would think that a forward-thinking government could really mitigate the fears and uncertainty uh, over the loss of coal mining jobs by making substantial investments in solar and wind in exactly these areas. The next is potential for biomass energy. I know that biomass can be somewhat controversial whether it's renewable or not, but nevertheless, as you can see, Saskatchewan has some of the highest potential in the country in its northern forests, not to mention that as a major agricultural producer, we also have a generous supply of agricultural waste that could be repurposed for biogas generation. The last is geothermal potential. Now Saskatchewan's not as rich uh, in this geothermal potential as other parts of the country, but as you can see, certain geothermal processes are viable in the southern part of the province. So in virtually every area of renewable energy, Saskatchewan is perhaps the best positioned uh, place to exploit these resources, yet we are not. As a province, we cannot claim poverty when it comes to renewable energy resources. We have a wealth of potential. We just don't seem to have the vision to properly exploit them. 
So while transition to a post-carbon energy system will be challenging, no place in the country is really better suited for that transition than right here. The question that leaves us with is, why are we not taking advantage of this prime position? What's preventing us? We often talk about lack of political will, and certainly that's part of it. But we also have to recognize that lack of political will is often the result of tremendous economic, or tremendous concentrations of economic and political power that would rather continue with business as usual. Interests that would view any transformation of the status quo as a fundamental threat. And this is why we emphasize that transition has to be more than just simply decarbonization. To succeed, it has to transform systems of power in this country as much as it has to transform systems of energy. I think too often we view this as a simple technocratic problem, just build more windmills. But we've seen that rational, detailed, technical arguments are not usually winning the day, no matter how grounded in logic or science. To me, this means that transition is equally a political problem as it is a technical problem. And I mean political in the original sense of the word, about power, who has it, who doesn't, who gets to make decisions, who has decisions foisted upon them. As we mentioned at the outset, that's why how we do transition is so important. Not just decarbonization, but also democratization and decolonization. Transition has to be able to build a base of power that can challenge those that would wish to obstruct or delay change and instill the political will in our politicians that, make, that will be necessary to make transition a success. Thank you.